Sir Ormond Hightower had been besieging Long Table about 30 leagues southwest of Bitterbridge. The village was crowded with men and women fleeing before his advancing host. The widowed Lady Caswell, whose husband had been beheaded by Aegon II in King's Landing when he refused to renounce his allegiances to Rhaenyra, closed her castle gates, going so far as to turn away knights and lords when they came seeking refuge and help. South of the river, the cook fires of the broken men could be seen through the trees by night, whilst the town sheltered hundreds of wounded and dying from men to women from all walks of life. Every inn in the area was full, if anything, dangerously overfull, even the hog's head, a dismal stiven inn. So when a man appeared alone from the north with a staff in one hand and a small boy on his back, the innkeeper had no room for him, and this man would find every inn to be full. That is, until the well-dressed traveller pulled a silver stag from his remarkably full purse. The startled innkeeper allowed the mysterious man and his young silver-haired son to find refuge in his stable, under the stipulation the man first mucked them out. The traveller agreed, setting aside his large pack and cloak, as he went to work with a spade and rake amidst the horses. The honour and trust of innkeeps and landlords has a well-deserved low reputation. The owner of the hog's head was a well-known local scoundrel, who in history is known as Ben Buttercakes, who wondered if there might be more silver stacks where there had been one after seeing the size of the traveller's coin purse. As the traveller worked up a sweat, cleaning the stables. Buttercakes offered to quench his thirst with a tankard of ale. The man accepted and accompanied the innkeep into the hogshead's common room, little suspecting that his host instructed his stable boy to search his pack for more silver. The boy found no coin within. What he did find was more precious and would define the events to come in the pages of history. A heavy cloak of fine white wool bordered in snowy satin wrapped around a dragon's egg. This humble traveller's son was Maelor Targaryen, the youngest son of King Aegon II, and the traveller was Sir Rickard Thorne, of the Kingsguard, his sworn shield and protector. Ben Buttercakes got no joy from his plan to steal Sir Rickard's silver. When the stable boy burst into the common room, with the cloak and egg in hand, shouting of his discovery, the traveller threw the dregs of his tankard into the innkeep's face, ripped his longsword from its sheath, and opened Buttercake from groin to neck, in one seamlessly quick motion. A few of the other drinkers drew swords and daggers of their own, but none were knights, and hesitated. In that brief moment of calm, Sir Rickard suddenly began to cut his way through them, one by one. Abandoning the stolen treasures, he scooped up the prince, fled to the stables, stole a fresh horse and burst from the inn, hell-bent for the old stone bridge and the south side of the Manda. He had come so far from King's Landing, and surely knew that safety lay only thirty leagues further on, where Lord Hightower sat encamped beneath the walls of Longtable. His goal was in sight, but thirty leagues might as well have been the far north and the wall. The road across the Manda was closed, and Britter Bridge belonged to Queen Rhaenyra, with the river too deep and rapid to cross. A hue and a cry went up. Other men around the inn took horses in pursuit of Rickard Thorne, shouting after him. Hearing the shouts, the guards at the foot of the bridge bade Sir Rickard halt but the bolting horse sped faster and faster. Thorn tried to ride them down and break through to safety of the Hightower camp. In one unlucky, unfortunate moment, just as safety seemed possible, one man grasped his horse's bridle. Thorn took his arm off at the shoulder and rode on, but the short delay of the dispatch guard gave his fellows time to form up on the south bank and they formed a wall against him. From both sides, men closed in, red-faced and shouting, brandishing swords and axes and thrusting with long spears. As Thorn turned this way and that, looking for any small chance of escape, wheeling his stolen mount in circle, as the guards drew ever closer, seeking some way through their ranks. Prince Maelor clung to him, shrieking, the screams breaking through the sound of the rattling still. It was a crossbow bolt that finally brought him down. One bolt took him in the arm, the next through the throat. So Rickard tumbled from the saddle, and died upon the bridge, with blood bubbling from his lips and drowning his last words. To the end, he clung to the boy he had sworn to defend, and to a washerwoman called Willow Poundstone, tore the weeping prince from his arms. Having slain the knight and seized the boy, however, the mob did not know what to do with their prize, many not even truly knowing who the screaming child was. Queen Rhaenyra had offered a great reward for his return, some recalled, but King's Landing was leagues away. 
Lord Hightower's army was much closer. Perhaps he would pay even more. When some asked if the reward was the same, whether the boy was alive or dead, Willow Poundstone clutched Maylor tighter and said no one was going to hurt her new son. The fool, Mushroom, tells us the woman was a monster, 30 stone in weight, simple-minded and half-mad, who'd heard her name pounding clothes clean in the river. Then, the stable boy came, shoving through the crowd, covered in his master's blood, to declare the prince was his, as he'd been the one to find the egg. The crossbowman, who's bolted his slain Sir Rickard Thorne, made claims as well, and so they argued, shouting, shoving above the knight's corpse. With so many present on the bridge, it's not surprising that we have many differing accounts on what befell Maelor Targaryen. Mushroom tells us that Willow Poundstone clutched the boy so tightly that she broke his back and crushed him to death, while Septon Eustace does not so much as mention Willow. However, in his account, the town butcher hacked the prince into six pieces with his cleaver, so all those fighting over him could have a piece. But Grand Maester Munkin's true telling says that the boy was torn limb from limb by the mob, but named no names. All we know for certain is that by the time Lady Caswell and her knights appeared to chase off the mob, the prince was dead. Her ladyship went pale at the sight of him. Mushroom claims she said, the gods will curse us all for this. At her command, the stable boy, Willow Poundstone, were hanged from the centre span of the old bridge, along with the man who had owned the horse Sir Rickard had stolen from the inn, who was wrongly thought to have assisted in Thorn's escape. Sir Rickard's corpse was wrapped in his white cloak, and Lady Caswell sent it back to King's Landing, together with Prince Maylor's head. The dragon's egg she sent to Lord Hightower at Long Table, in hopes it might dampen his wrath. Mushroom who loved Queen Rhaenyra very well, tells us that she wept when Maelor's small head was placed before her as she sat at the Iron Throne, while Septon Eustace, who loved her very little, says rather that she smiled and commanded the head be burned, for he was still blood of the dragon. The truth of the matter is most likely somewhere in the middle of the two towers. Though no announcement of the boy's death was made, word of his demise nonetheless spread throughout the city of King's Landing, and soon another tale was told as well, one that claimed that Rhaenyra had the prince's head delivered to his mother, Queen Helena, in her chamber pot. Though the story had no truth to it, soon it was on every pair of lips in King's Landing. The full mushroom puts this down to Larry Strong, the clubfoot's work, a man who gathers whispers can spread them just as well.